hppodcast.com. And begin. Life is a hideous thing, and from the background behind what we know of it, peer demoniacal hints of truth, which make it sometimes a thousandfold more hideous. Science, already oppressive with its shocking revelations, will perhaps be the ultimate exterminator of our species, if separate species we be, for its reserve of unguessed horrors could never be borne by mortal brains if loosed upon the world. If we knew what we are, we should do as Sir Arthur German did, and Arthur German soaked himself in oil and set fire to his clothing one night. No one placed the charred fragments in an urn, or set a memorial to him who had been. For certain papers, and a certain boxed object were found, which made men wish to forget. Some who knew him do not admit he ever existed. Boy, this guy must have done some really bad stuff for yeah. people to not want to bury him or... Or do anything to his body. You know, just yeah, like not him. admit that they knew him. Yeah. Well, it backs up the opening line of this. Life is a hideous thing. Boy, is it. What a great opening line. I, I bet you he's going to prove this, uh, yeah. or at least attempt to in some way. Uh-huh. This, it, this writer named H.P. Lovecraft. H.P. Lovecraft. Uh, my name is Chris Lackey. I'm Chad Pfeiffer. And this is the H.P. Lovecraft Living Room Podcast. We're at hppodcraft.com. And this week we're talking about a story called The Facts Concerning the Late Arthur German and His yeah. Family. That's right. And uh, that opening is pretty famous for Lovecraft. It, Although it almost seems like a, um, an, a first draft of the opening, the, the famous of, opening. Of Call of Cthulhu. Call of yeah, Cthulhu, that's yeah. right. And it's much much better in Call of yeah. Cthulhu. Yeah, although, I, you know, life is a First draft. Home. Yeah, first, first draft. draft. Uh, that was read by uh, Brad Lohan, who is the man behind entertainmentbuff.com, which yeah. is, a, is a blog, a daily blog, a site for comics and movie reviews. It's very funny. Yeah, he's you good. Should, you should check it out. He's good. He's real good. Mm. Yeah. Mm, yeah. Uh, so, uh... <laughs> So what happens? This guy sets himself on fire. That's yeah, the well, opening of the story. Pretty dramatic. Yeah, so, so let's find out what, ha- what would motivate that guy. It says, uh, Arthur German went out of the moor and burned himself after seeing the boxed object which had come from Africa. It was this object, and not his peculiar personal appearance, which made him end his life. So here we're introducing Arthur. He's the guy in the title. Yeah. Uh, and what we know so far is that he's very ugly. Yeah, well, peculiar. He's peculiar looking, looking yeah. and, uh, and not necessarily ugly, just strange. Right, and it, but it's it's he's goofy looking enough that it would be a serious impediment to most people. Yeah, but for Arthur, he's a poet, he's yeah. a scholar, and mm-hmm. so he manages to get through it. But that's all we know. That's all we know. Before we get into him too much, we we way backtrack and we go through his lineage. We want to know about his family. Yeah, and uh, this maybe, actually maybe some facts uh, exactly. <laughs> we want to learn some <laughs> facts about him, but what about his family? Yeah, facts concerning his family. Uh, this actually occupies quite a bit of the story's text, so let's try and summarize it. Uh, Easily. His uh, great 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 grandfather, mm-hmm. Arthur's great 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 grandfather, was Sir Wade German. Yes. He was an early explorer of the, of the Congo first. region. Right. One Africa. of the first. And, uh, and he wrote a book called Observation on the Several Parts of Africa, which had weird bits in it about a prehistoric white Congolese civilization. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And uh, that actually, that little bit of information that he shared, or mystery, or, or rumor, mm-hmm. landed him in an asylum in uh, yeah. 1765. No. Well, before he was sent to the madhouse. Right. We know that he got sent there, but he lived in a house. Mm-hmm. He, you know, and I think this all takes place in England. Yeah, yeah. German is uh, an English name. Right. And he had a bizarre collection of stuff from his travels, and he had this wife that nobody saw. Nobody saw, not even the servants. Right. He kept them secluded, uh, or kept her secluded, mm-hmm. in a whole other wing of the, of the manor that they lived in. Yeah, Jane Eyre style. He's got her up there. Uh, he, and he says that, that she's the daughter of this Portuguese trader, and it's just that she doesn't like English ways. No, she hates it. Yeah. That's what he says. <laughs> it's so obvious. I, yeah, I don't, I'm not... Uh, it's I'm not it's so it. obvious. It's like, I wish that he's... He added things like, nobody thought it bizarre that he had massive amounts of bananas ordered to the house in the middle of the night. <laughs> or the disturbing, almost mechanical cymbal playing coming from the, his wife's room. No. <laughs> <laughs> no. Did, uh, <laughs> did, um, now, when Wade was out there and he said there was a white, did he say there were white people or did he say there were white apes at this point? He didn't. He just says that it's this white civilization. White civilization. So, yeah, I so, guess they're white people. White people. Okay. In, in the Congo and Africa. And, um, and when, you know, when, in his first couple of trips, he came back with this wife and, and then uh, they had a son together. Yes. When they were over in Africa and they bring this, this son back mm-hmm. here. Uh, so that's a little odd. He's got kind of an eccentric family. But but it was the talk of Sir Wade, especially when in his cups, which chiefly led his friends to deem him mad. In a rational age like the 18th century, it was unwise for a man of learning to talk about wild sights and strange scenes under a Congo moon. 
of the gigantic walls and pillars of a forgotten city, crumbling and vine-grown, and of damp, silent stone steps leading interminably down into the darkness of abysmal treasure vaults and inconceivable catacombs, especially was unwise to rave of the living things that might haunt such a place, of creatures half of the jungle and half of the impiously aged city, things that might have sprung up after the great apes had overrun the dying city, with the vaults and the pillars, the vaults and the weird carvings. Mm. So yeah, he was talking about this this ancient city that he found in his travels in the Congo. Yeah, he'd get a little drunk and say, they got chimp boys up there in the Congo. <laughs> Planet of the Apes stuff or uh, Island of Dr. Moreau. Island kind of Dr. Moreau kind of craziness. They shut Sir Wade away for yeah. talking mm-hmm. all this craziness. And, and his son uh, that he had with this mysterious wife yes. is Philip, mm-hmm. uh, who is coarse. And uh, he's almost like a Mr. Hyde kind of figure. Yeah, he sort of vaguely describes some sort of ape-like yeah. uh, qualities to right. him. And Philip, he marries a gypsy woman whom he knocks up, but before the, the, the gypsy has, uh, well, they think she might be of gypsy extraction. Right. Um, before that kid is born, he slips off into the Navy, and all anybody knows about Philip is that he eventually disappeared off the Congo coast. Yeah, nobody ever saw Philip again. Yeah, so maybe he went back to where his, his father had done his... Uh... Done his stuff? Yeah, his exploring. Mm-hmm. Now, the son of Philip is Robert German. Yeah. And he's actually kind of handsome. So maybe that was some of that gypsy blood getting in there. Oh, yeah, hello. Uh, he starts studying his his grandfather. Sir Wade is now his grandfather. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Starts studying Sir Wade's relics from Africa. And Robert uh, gets himself a wife, and he has three kids, two of whom are never seen. Right. Because they're, well, people assume deformed. Yeah, they have some kind of deformities, or they're, uh, um, I think he said deformed of the mind also, that, that they're just yeah, they're just kind of messed kind up. Kind of crazy. Yeah. So, uh, but the son that does show himself of uh, Robert's is Neville. Mm-hmm. And Neville is the next German, and he's a repellent type. He's not as handsome as his father. No. And uh, he, and he actually, at, at some point, runs away with a dancer. All these German men seem to like uh, artistic yeah, women. Artistic, yeah, yeah kind of free-spirited types. Yeah. And uh, he runs away with a dancer, and he comes back to his father, and he's a widower. His, his wife died along the way somehow, but he's got a son, mm-hmm. Alfred. And, and Alfred actually, I think, ends up being... Arthur's father. Arthur's dad. Yeah. Yeah. So we're getting there. Yeah, yeah. We're finally, uh, it, we're finally at a biblical pace. <laughs> yes. We're, we're getting to the, the main character. There's a lot of begatting going on here. There is a bit of oddity here that's that's pretty cool. Uh, Robert, who had been traveling to Africa mm-hmm. on these expeditions to sort of support his grandfather's research, right, right. he dies in a kind of violent episode. Yeah. Uh, a friend, an explorer, comes to see him, and he's got a manuscript of notes that he collected among an African tribe called the Angas. Mm-hmm. Um, and that and it has details about a gray city, mm-hmm. white apes ruled by, uh, like a goddess or a, a, yeah, like a white god, a white god. Yeah, the explorer comes and they they kind of go into a room to talk about it, mm-hmm. and uh, and then he, he freaking uh, kills him. Yeah, whatever he hears from this explorer, he he freaks out and yep. he he strangles the explorer, and then he kills his three kids. He kills his children, including Neville. Yeah, but Neville dies, her, somewhat heroically defending his own son, Alfred. And, mm-hmm. uh, and and Robert gets institutionalized. He dies in the institution yeah. of apope- apoplexy. Yes. Which is kind uh, of an antiquated thing. Yeah, well, yeah, a little background on this one. A- the apoplexy uh, is kind of like a paralysis. Supposedly, mm-hmm. uh, Lovecraft's father, he um, you know, he died of syphilis. Mm-hmm. Uh, but supposedly, Lovecraft didn't really know it was syphilis. Yeah. His mom told him that he suffered from ap- ap- apoplexy. Apoplexy. Yeah. And uh, so there's a little bit of... I mean, the story has a lot of Lovecraft weaving his yeah. own personal family. And I think that this into. little section, especially about Alfred, is, yeah. is very similar to him because of the apoplexy, which uh-huh. he might have, you know, was told. And that was kind of a catch-all disease. It means that they had a fury or whatever, and then they went paralyzed. Yeah, they, would par- they couldn't move or anything like that. And, uh, and which, then, wasn't, which also wasn't true. His, di- his dad didn't yeah. suffer from it because um, there are accounts of him going, like, when he was suffering from syphilis in the mm-hmm. institution, he would, like be screaming all night and like you know causing problems right because he went totally nuts yeah and but lovecraft thought um in his correspondence that he had you know this he was paralyzed right so it's it's similar to to how lovecraft's dad Mm -hmm. went away yeah and then so alfred he grows up with the title and um he hooks up with a music hall singer uh and they have a kid and this is arthur uh but alfred he he ends up joining the circus and and kind of leaving them behind Mm -hmm. he runs away with the circus and uh he gets in a, a bizarre gorilla accident. <laughs> yeah, uh, kind of strange. He gets obsessed. Well, in the circus, they have a gorilla, and he gets obsessed with it and, and starts training it to do... He's really good with this gorilla. Yes. Uh, Alfred is, and he, he teaches it to do special tricks, and it's really good, but 
during one performance, they're doing a little uh, boxing match. Yeah, it's a little bit that they're... Because he's... For some reason, he has a rapport with this gorilla. Right. You know, I wonder why. And uh, <laughs> they do this bit where, yeah, like you said, there's a boxing match, like a little shtick that they do. But I guess at one point, the gorilla freaking hits him too hard. Yeah. And he goes nuts. And yeah. he freaking attacks the gorilla, like, with a, in, a, in a rage. Yeah, bites him he bites him yeah and then the gorilla is like i'm not putting up with that and just freaking kills yeah, him yeah <laughs> gorilla yeah he just just annihilates him the funny thing i thought there was lovecraft he he doesn't refer to it specifically as the barnum and bailey circus but he calls it the greatest show on right, earth in yeah, quotes yeah. it reminded me of these urban legends about disneyland mm-hmm. and you're like i'm not gonna say the name of it you know somebody will say like there's a series of tunnels underneath this theme park where they keep you know oh, right, right. child prostitutes and where you know <laughs> They enslave people. I'm not going to say what it is, but I'll just say it, it isn't always the happiest place on earth. You know, they, they throw it out there as if it's mysterious at all. Like, that's clever. I know exactly what you're talking about. Oh, Love golly. That. Even here in the, the aughts, we, we know what you're talking about. We know about. what's up. Okay, so Arthur now is the last of yeah, the Yeah, he's the last one because his dad took off. And and... This is actually, we get into the, this is the second chapter of the story. So the first chapter kind of set up all this lineage yes. for us. And here in the second chapter, we get to Arthur. Uh, it says, When the husband and father deserted his family, the mother took the child to German House, where there was none left to object to her presence. She was not without notions of what a nobleman's dignity should be, and saw to it that her son received the best education which limited money could provide. The family resources were now sadly slender, and the German House had fallen into woeful disrepair. But young Arthur loved the old edifice, and all its contents. He was not like any other German who had ever lived, for he was a poet and a dreamer. Hmm. Well, that sounds familiar. Yeah. Uh, I think it's not too cleverly veiled, but the, the, this seems like Lovecraft. When he was a kid, his house, you know, they had money, but it fell into disrepair because they, you know, their fortune was lost, and he loved the mm-hmm. place, and he was a dreamer, and he was off on his own, and he felt very different from everybody else. And, and he was kind of um, not a very good-looking person. No. And I know that Lovecraft had some anxiety over his own physical appearance. Right, right. And... Which I guess was kind of... But his mom really... Yeah, he actually doesn't seem that bad looking to me. No, he, he looks like maybe he's a little odd, but... He's a little weird looking, but not, not that bad. And... Well, as it pertains to Arthur, uh, Lovecraft writes, It is hard to say just what he resembled, but his expression, his facial angle, and the length of his arms gave a thrill of repulsion to those who met him for the first time. <laughs> <laughs> of his arms. Yeah, yeah strange. I don't remember that. Uh, so Arthur, he goes off to school, and, and after he gets out of Oxford... He does what a lot of his forebears have done, and he decides to take up the family business and examine Sir, uh, Sir Wade's work. Uh-huh. In 1911, after the death of his mother, Sir Arthur German determined to pursue his investigations to the utmost extent, selling a portion of his estate to obtain the requisite money. He outfitted an expedition and sailed for the Congo. So he goes out there, and, and uh, he gets all kinds of information. Uh, and as it turns out, it looks like his great-great great grandpa wasn't all that crazy he talks to this tribal chief named Mm -hmm. uh, muanu according to muanu the gray city and the hybrid creatures were no more having been annihilated by the warlike nabangus many years ago this tribe after destroying most of the edifices and killing the live beings had carried off the stuffed goddess which had been the object of their quest the white ape goddess which the strange beings worshipped and which was held by congo tradition to be the form of one who had reigned as a princess among these beings so she was some uh, important, you know, uh, leader who's mm-hmm. deified, which isn't too uncommon. And, yeah. and, you know, like the Egyptians believe their, you know, kings were exactly. gods manifest. And and there's stories about this ape princess, uh, that right. she was the consort of this great white god. And, mm-hmm. and they had a child together and then, and then all three went away. Right. Which syncs up with Sir Wade's stories, uh, you know, earlier when he was in his house and he had this strange wife and they had their son that they brought back from Africa. Right. And in these legends in the Congo, they some say that the husband returned and enshrined the body himself. Uh, some say the son later returned as a man, mm-hmm. which syncs up with uh, his son having disappeared off right. the coast of the Congo. Yep. So this is all kind of coming together. Arthur, uh, he sails back to England, but when he does, he finds out from this Belgian trader, uh, the, the trader, he knows where the stuffed goddess is. Yeah. And he says, you know what the tribe who has it, they're submissive. Uh, they can be talked into parting with it. <laughs> It's crazy. Yeah, talked into party. Yeah, uh-huh. um, and check it out. I'm going to take care of this for you, and you're going to get it in the mail. Sure. So Arthur's very excited. He gets back to England. He waits around. And um, it's some of the justification he has in here is funny when he's like, well, you know, why is it that, that my 
that Sir Wade kept that woman in the in the house. It must have been that she just didn't agree with his fanciful notions about the Congo, and <laughs> that would be hard for any man to take. So he probably just didn't want her to be around because he was mad at her all the time. <laughs> so ridiculous. Ridiculous. So he soon gets a letter from his Belgian friend that they found it. Uh-huh. It was the Belgian affair, a most extraordinary object, an object quite beyond the power of a layman to classify. Whether it was human or simian, only a scientist could determine and the process of determination would be greatly hampered by its imperfect condition. Time and the Congo climate are not kind to mummies, especially when their preparation is as amateurish as seemed to be the case here. Around the creature's neck had been found a golden chain bearing an empty locket, no doubt some hapless traveler's keepsake. (laughs) Just hearing that just now, uh, time and the Congo climate are not kind to mummies. (laughs) Like, mummies are going online. Like, if you're going to go on vacation, do not go there. Don't go to the Congo. Yeah. It's, it's Bad totally climate. not good for us. Stick to Egypt. <laughs> Stick to Egypt. Or even Southern California is not bad, right. you know? Yeah. <laughs> the Belgian also suggests some kind of humorous comparison in his letter, but he doesn't go into much detail. It hints that maybe he made a joke like, you you should see this thing. It looks, You'll get it when you see it. Like... <laughs> God, it's, it might remind you of somebody, you know. It's like he made a little. It says that in there, but he doesn't say what it is. Right. right he probably right. thought it was going to be pretty funny. <laughs> oh no, 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 not very funny. So the thing arrives, and the German butler recalls what happened. Mm-hmm. According to this trustworthy man, Sir Arthur German dismissed everyone from the room before opening the box. Nothing was heard for some time. Just how long, Soames cannot exactly determine. But it was certainly less than a quarter of an hour later that the horrible scream, undoubtedly in German's voice, was heard. Immediately afterward, German emerged from the room, rushing frantically toward the front of the house as if pursued by some hideous enemy. The expression on his face, a face ghastly enough in repose, was beyond description. When near the front door, he seemed to think of something and turned back in his flight, finally disappearing down the stairs to the cellar. The servants were utterly dumbfounded and watched at the head of the stairs, but their master did not return. A smell of oil was all that came up from the regions below. After dark, a rattling was heard at the door leading from the cellar into the courtyard, and a stable boy saw Arthur German, glistening from head to foot with oil and redolent of that fluid, steal furtively out and vanish on the black moor surrounding the house. Then, in an exultation of supreme horror, everyone saw the end. A spark appeared on the moor, a flame arose, and a pillar of human fire reached to the heavens. The House of German no longer existed. Man, that something something so horrible must yeah. have happened that made him something that he saw, something that was in that package that made him set himself on fire. Like what what could possibly be that bad? I don't know. (laughs) Well, they wonder about that, and so they go in and examine the mummy. The two particulars in question are these. The arms on the golden locket about the creature's neck were the German arms, and the jocose suggestion about certain resemblance as connected with the shriveled face applied with vivid, ghastly, and unnatural horror to none other than the sensitive Arthur German, great-great-great-grandson of Sir Wade German and an unknown wife members of the Royal Anthropological Institute burned the thing and threw the locket into a well and some of them do not admit that Arthur German ever existed wow that that's the end it's the end of the house of German and the end of this story the end of the story um you know uh, not that horrific really <laughs> I mean it's kind of yeah. just disturbing but right. I mean it's, I would be kind of a little creeped out if I found out that I was the same yeah. from a half Half ape woman was my great 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 grandmother. Yeah, yeah. Like I'd go, wow, that feel a little weird out weird out by that. But to set yourself on fire because of it, yeah, like, man, that's, I don't know. I was I gotta say let down by the story. <laughs> well, I I remember I read it when I was in high school, and, and even then I thought it was pretty silly. And uh, and then rereading it recently kind of confirmed that opinion. But when I asked Brad to do the reading for this, he and he wasn't familiar with the story and he asked me what it was without thinking i I just said to him it's about this guy you know he sets himself on fire when he finds out his great great grandpa (laughs) the gorilla (laughs) (laughs) and brad was like are you kidding that story sounds awesome (laughs) and i thought well yeah you know what it kind of is you know you just said that who would set themselves on fire actually 
I remember, and, and maybe it was in the mid '90s or late '90s, there was a woman in Peoria, who uh, Peoria, Illinois, huh? who drove her car into the gas station, or maybe she just walked up there. She paid for some gas. She doused herself in the gasoline and then set herself on fire right, right there. Yeah. You remember that? No, I don't remember. I'm that. sure that's not the only time that's no, happened. No, I mean, I mean, you could just be crazy and set yourself on fire, and I understand that. Yeah. That's, but this is supposed to be a horrific revelation that would, mm-hmm. you know, it's not that horrific. It's it's like, come on. I mean, we're all descended from, you know, from apes, and we all have, like, I mean... Not that close. Not that close, no. Yeah. But, I mean, they're not, it's not even an ape. It's like a half ape. It's it's this... Right. You know, there's a whole bunch of stuff in the in the background of this. You know, at the at this time, this is something Ken Height uh, talks about in his book, too, is that at the time, scientific racism was really prevalent. This is before, hmm. like, the whole eugenics thing was going on. Like, scientifically speaking, it'll be in the genes that... You know, some people are better than other people. Right. You know what I mean? Like, that was something that was going on. And it's really confusing in the story because, you know, the line in the very beginning kind of implies that we all might be descended from the white apes. All the yeah, white people. all white people. All white people might be descended from the white apes. So, like, you know, we're even much more different from black people, according to mm. Lovecraft, you know, black people or any other kind of non-white people yeah. than we think. Like, we even d- descended from different apes than they descended yeah. from, which is, you know, just f so up and, and weird. It, it, yeah, I, maybe it's just, this is a, a, a product of the time, you know, like, yeah. this is one of those things, maybe at the time it was really horrific to think that you came from an ape, and maybe evolution still wasn't really accepted right. i mean the the scopes monkey trial isn't until 1926 you know what but, I mean? yeah but that's not i mean people were outraged before then when people tried to teach evolution in oh, schools right. yeah and, mm-hmm. yeah so i mean maybe part of the horror of this is that not only that we're descended from apes but we are you know you're actually interbred with apes and there's, yeah. there's something that's going on well it's similar to uh the tomb in that there's that horror of uh of a cursed lineage, you know, well, right. being connected to these ancestors and finding out this hideous thing about your past. Well, it's sort of, I mean, and again, it ties into Lovecraft. Like, this mm-hmm. is, I mean, it seems pretty obvious that he, his, both his parents went insane. He didn't know that it was from syphilis. Yeah, right. So he must have been thinking, I'm going to eventually, what happened to my parents is going to happen to me. Mm-hmm. And I think that comes across in the story. Like, this is kind of a, you know, an allegory to his his own sure. family. And, and we touched on it when we talked about the tomb. I think that it's something that it's almost a universal experience that people in the short term think, holy crap, I'm becoming my parents. Yeah. Maybe in the long term, they they think, if you're an American, I can't believe my people did what they did to the Native Americans. Or if, right. or like in our last show, we talked about the, the, the temple, the, the German right. guy. These guys name, this guy's name is Arthur German. Yeah. It made me think, like, you know, I'm of German extraction, and sometimes I'm, you know, God, my people did that. Oh jeez! You know, yeah. it's just. I mean, there's a lot of. But that's the that's the story of the human race, right? Yeah. But uh, Cubans have done horrible things. Horrible things. To, there is no people that are yeah. is exempt from absolutely not. being descended from people that did horrible things. And yet, that real that moment of realization when it's like these are these are my people that yeah. did this, and I'm from this I'm tradition from them, of people yeah. who maybe did that. Um, that's it's not a pro- it's not a pleasant thing. No, no. But I mean. Uh, and but on all honesty, I mean these ideas are very interesting and could have been explored in a much uh, one more interesting way and to uh, just told uh, better storytelling. Like sure, the first part of this is just like a, a you know a genealogical you know and it's confusing it's, yeah and, and it's like know. wait you know uh, Arthur and Alfred you know their names are very similar yeah. and so like who's the, like I I read it a few times and it was still confused by you know who was whose father. And it was almost worth it, though, for the uh, scene with the boxing match the boxing? with the gorilla. <laughs> the boxing gorilla. Because that's hilarious. <laughs> so somehow Alfred was wise enough to know that he could train this gorilla to do things. Yeah. He wasn't... Why did he set up a boxing match? I don't know. <laughs> you know, I didn't write this down in my notes, but this there's an excellent Ed Wood movie called The Bride and the Beast. Oh, right, yeah, yeah. Did you, did you uh-huh. see that? Yeah, where some parts of it. I, I think it's a woman keeps a gorilla as her pet, and this guy marries her. Or wait, maybe it's he's got the gorilla. I don't remember who's got the gorilla, but yeah, it's the guy. They get married, and he's like, I want to show you something. And she comes in, and he opens up the door, and there's a gorilla in his house in a cage. He's like, this is my pet gorilla, Spanky. I didn't <laughs> tell you about it before. But when she sees him, she starts hearing jungle drums in her head, and, uh-huh. and she starts dreaming of going back to Africa. And she actually... Gosh, it's been a while since I've seen it, but she does... The gorilla captures her, and uh-huh. somehow they wind up back in the... Uh, in the jungle. Yeah. 
and and she's sort of married to this gorilla. She, then. it's yeah, it's a really weird, uh, surprisingly for yeah, for Ed Wood. Ed Wood. Uh, weird the one thing story. I remember about it so well though is is the guy shows up to uh, to save her, and one of the gorillas attacks him, and the gorilla completely delivers a one-two punch. <laughs> <laughs> this gorilla learned fisticuffs somehow, and they have a little... Could have been a, a boxing match. Maybe yeah. that's what he, he did. It seemed to be the, the thing to do at the time. There's another excellent NPR show called Radio Lab. Oh, yeah. I've listened to every single episode of it, and, and you, folks, you should really check it out if you haven't it's, listened it's to a, it. It's a great show. Uh, they had a story on there about a woman... Well, here, I'll, <laughs> I'll read the setup. One day in 1994, soon after Lee Silver, a professor of molecular biology and public affairs, lectured on the genetic similarity of chimpanzees and humans and the theoretical possibility of producing a hybrid chimp-human. A student who had heard him speak came to his office with an astonishing idea for a thesis project. She proposed being impregnated with the sperm of a chimpanzee, following the development of the chimp-human hybrid, aborting near the end of the pregnancy, and writing up the experiment for her senior thesis. Would Silver be her advisor, she asked. Silver was speechless. That incident became the spark for play that Silver co-wrote with a New York actor and playwright, Jeremy Kerrigan. It's called The uh, Sweet, Sweet Motherhood. Yeah. So she didn't actually do it. No, she didn't do it. Uh, fortunately, he talked her out of doing yeah. it. Yeah. <laughs> and it was funny, too, because it seemed like she was a, like, kind of a party girl. You know, like, uh-huh. And that was like her easy way of having yeah. to do any work. Oh, my God, you're right. Yeah, it does yeah. sound like an 80s movie or something. Yeah, she's like, you know. I if, can never pass this class. But what, what if I impregnate myself with uh, some chip sperm? It's and like, then girls just want to have fun, starts playing. <laughs> then, and then you cut to a chimp, you know, at a dormitory, like dancing and stuff. Maybe she falls in love with the donor or something. Oh dear, yeah. Maybe that's the prequel to MVP. Could be Most Valuable Primate. The, oh yeah, I remember that. Chimp, yeah, chimp a, playing hockey. Pretty, pretty amazing movie. Well, uh, they, this guy Silver says the play asks, "What does it mean to be human?" You know, by looking at whether a chimp-human hybrid would be, would it be human? Would it be a chimp? And yeah. to examine the genetic similarity. He says, uh, this is a very threatening question because the Judeo-Christian idea that human beings as a species, they're absolutely distinct from all other species. Right. So it's, it's threatening, you know. Yeah. And I mean, that's, I mean, it's the same thing that happened at, at the Scopes trial. You know, mm-hmm. like that's what we're, humans were special. And by us being equated to these animals and being part of them or related to them, I mean, again, we're not descended. It's the apes and us have a common ancestor. Right. We're not, we're not descended from chimps. We yeah. both have, you know, at one point we were cousins or brothers or you know like way up the uh, evolutionary chain <laughs> but that it, it would f- freak people out especially since people thought that they were the best sasha baron cohen did it really well when he in an allergy episode when he was talking to an anti-evolution guy and he said well in that character of allergy uh-huh. well i like bananas and chimps like bananas so <laughs> how could you not believe that evolution is real <laughs> so funny <laughs> The guy who was interviewing was so frustrated. <laughs> Why was this written? The, the, when, uh, this was written... Um, uh, when was it written? When was it written? I'm not sure. It was, well, it was written in 1920. Uh, What's the background of the story? The background of the story was first published in The Wolverine, another amateur press journal, mm-hmm. uh, in March and June in 21. So it was published soon after it was written. When it was first published in Weird Tales, it was reprinted in Weird Tales, it was called The White Ape, and Lovecraft mm-hmm. was not cool with that. Yeah, he didn't want any spoilers. He thought it time. felt like it spoiled the... Story right. as if whatever. it isn't obvious from the first paragraph. <laughs> it's really obvious, and then it was also just called Ar- Arthur German, like that mm-hmm. was the name of it. And then, but the full title is the one that we told. Yeah. You. yeah. One of the critics. This is something that I thought was interesting. His name was William Fulweiler. Mm-hmm. He said that he felt like Lovecraft lifted the white ape thing from Ed- Edgar Rice Burroughs' uh, The mm-hmm. Return of Tarzan and Tarzan and the Jewels of Opar. Uh, which the city of Opar had like these ape human. I've read Tarzan and oh, yeah. I have. That oh, was yes. one of my favorite books when I was a right. kid. And actually, in that book, now I which haven't looked written, at it in a long time. This was written, and that was written in 1916. So, well and there was this. a uh, there's there's some sort of princess in that in that book uh, that I fell in love with when I read that. Wait, I remember I, really well. Do you mean she wasn't an ape princess? Oh no, there was an illustration of her on the cover of the oh, book. Oh, I see. You know, and I wow. I was gonna say I find it hard for a young person to fall in love with like a written character. I did though. But if you saw the picture, well, yeah, there was yeah, the I image think it was the visual. But you know, she was cool. I don't I don't remember that book that well. I I really liked Edgar Rice Burroughs a lot when I was a, when I was a kid. Yeah, and, I, I've never read any Edgar Rice Burroughs. Was Tar- Tarzan and John Carter of Mars, and uh, there was a cool connection in. I mentioned when we did the statement of Randolph Carter mm-hmm. that Randolph Carter appears in the in the first uh, collected uh, League of Extraordinary Gentlemen. Yes, and I incorrectly said that he was the protagonist of that story. He's not the protagonist of that story. Alan Quartermain is. But when Alan Quartermain runs into him, 
it's Randolph Carter, and they reveal that he's actually brothers with John Carter, who's the Edgar Rice Burroughs character who went to Mars. Oh, my God. So they're this, like, brother team, which was I thought was really clever. Cool. Whoa. <laughs> that's pretty neat. No, I didn't, I didn't remember that. So yeah. guys remember that. It's been a while since I've read that, but that's a really cool comic, and I recommend it all is. of our listeners to check out The League of Extraordinary Gentlemen. And, and it's not for the, uh, um, the delicate fun. of sensibilities. No. Yeah, it's... Uh, and when I was thinking about when they described... Uh, Germans ancestors here and they were coarse and I said that they reminded me of Mr. Hyde the Mr. Hyde I'm actually referring to is the comic book Mr. Yes. Hyde from League of Stu- League the way of... he's drawn that's what I think the Germans would look like yeah not the one from the terrible film adaptation no is. no no not at all but uh, you know basically I, I, I don't care much for the story um, there's a, there's interesting parts to it but, yeah um, you know by and large it's kind of silly it, it reminds me of when you know when the the horror genre was dying down in the in the forties and fifties, and all of the all the movies they were making were more comical than they were horrific, and there were all these gorilla movies, you know, where they'd have a, a like the Bowery Boys against the gorilla, right? Or, uh-huh. or actually, I think there's a movie Bella Lugosi meets a Brooklyn gorilla, you know. Somehow, how did a gorilla become a monster? I think it was a cheap costume. I think that's exactly I think that's what, it what it was. And Diagnosis was a... correct. Yeah. I think that's exactly what was going on. <laughs> Oh, so you know, I, I I agree with you. It's um, I wouldn't recommend it no, to somebody getting into this stuff. No, why is it? Please pass pass on this one. If you never yeah. read this story, I think you're better off. <laughs> skipping it. Yeah. I don't know about better hey, off. Look, but look, you're I'm not gonna saying, miss out. No, you're not gonna miss out. If you listen to this podcast, you've you've done enough. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> on the author Arthur or Arthur German stuff because there's a finite time in all of our lives. You're right. And you know, there's other things you should be reading. Yeah. No, yeah. Or skip right to the second chapter. Right. Read the first paragraph and then skip to the second chapter. Yeah. Or if you just want to be a completist, read the damn thing. Yeah. <laughs> well, well that's, that's what we did. <laughs> that's, yeah, well, yeah, that's what we did. Um, but I, I have nothing more to say about this, Myself and I would love it. to wrap up this week's episode. I want to thank our reader again. Yeah. Yes, Brad Lohan, uh, entertainmentbuff.com. Check it out. Yeah, check him. Check him out. It's, it's and uh, next week, we are going to be talking about The Street. The Street, yeah. And uh, we'll, we're going to have a, a special guest. A special guest. Uh, kind of a... An expert. Yeah, we're going to talk a little bit more next week about the larger literary significance of H.P. Lovecraft, as well as the story of the street, yeah. with our special guest, Matt Barisi. Yeah. And we'll get to know him a little better next week. Yeah, so. he'll be on. For now, uh, I'm Chad Pfeiffer. I'm Chris Lackey, and this has been the H.P. Lovecraft Literary Podcast. HPPodcraft.com. HPPodcraft.com. <laughs>